Kia ora Nanaia. Thank you for your mahi. It's been a long time and you've, you've been there um, in so many different spaces and um, so many people spoke very warmly of you today that we've spoken to, so kia ora. Yeah. Well, I'm out, not down. <laughs> <laughs> that seems to be a recurring thing. That's yeah. what the Prime um, Chris Hipkins said yeah. the other yeah. night. Yeah. What have you learnt about yourself going through Parliament, being in Parliament for this length of time? Yeah, well, I'm lucky to be supported by a fantastic husband. Um, and he gave me some salient words and he said, look, if it doesn't kill you, it makes you stronger. Just keep going. And um, I kind of have adopted uh, that perspective on a number of challenges that I've met in my life. Uh, and there have been many. Uh, but just keep getting up and keep moving forward. And forward we must go. I was thinking back to one of the big challenges that you must have faced would have been around the foreshore and seabed. That must have been a challenging decision for you to stay. How did you work that one out in your head? Well, actually, the first challenge I had was coming into Parliament when I had just turned 26 and I stood and yes. contested the seat against Tuku Morgan. <laughs> and at that time, uh, yes, the irony of it all, <laughs> I mean, we, since then we've, we've grown to understand each other and we have worked together. But at that time, I was seen as too young, didn't have enough life experience, didn't have enough um, ability to represent a view, uh, and that was kind of what I was confronted with when Tuku and I contested uh, for this, uh, the Te Tai Hawaiuri seat. Yes, for sure, and Seedburg was another turning point in my life. It taught me a lot about how to listen to the people and their aspirations and how to give voice to that within a political process. It was actually the first time I took myself off uh, the party list because I believed if I hadn't done a good enough job, I'd, I'd just leave uh, the decision up to the people. And they, they put me back in, so I used the political process for their benefit. And I've learned a lot, just mm. from representing, from parliament, understanding the process, and then being given the huge honour to undertake a number of roles. So there's lots of expectations when you, as a Māori, in parliament, and then when you get to the cabinet minister thing, you know, you must just have people coming at you all the time, um, saying, you know, we want this, we do that. I mean, how do you handle that? If you don't know yourself, know who you are, what you stand for, your values, then you will struggle. And if you don't have internal fortitude and strength around what you believe in, that place will eat you up in a minute. And I think about young people coming into Parliament like Hannah, it's going to be really important to have a strong support base uh, to be able to not shield you, because you have to do, you have to undertake all the experiences of that place, but give you perspective, ground you, be able to provide other views so that you can uh, navigate what is ultimately a, a very different place in order to get progress. Um, but it's simply not good enough, which is one of the things I did say to you. It's simply not good, good enough to stand on the sidelines. Hauraki Waikato deserves representation where our issues are front row centre to taking this country forward and we have to advocate in that way. Is it a challenge being uh, representing an electorate and then having these ministerial portfolios? Because that must... <laughs> was that an eye roll there? Because well, it must, you know, take your energy into different places. Well, you try and converge your energy so that you are the most efficient that you can be uh, with the roles that you have. And by that I mean, you know, if you've been given the opportunity to be a minister, you always consider the, the portfolio and what it can do and how, how you take your policies forward, improve the lives of your people, and hopefully that translates back to your electorate. Mm. When I think about uh, rates for emission of whenua Māori that um, I did when I was Māori Development Minister, the procurement policy, when I think about uh, the Māori housing strategy, all of that had a nationwide benefit, but it also had an electorate benefit, and we've seen the fruits of that coming mm. through. Similarly, in my portfolio of foreign affairs, now, in my little community, they don't talk about foreign affairs at all. <laughs> so you have to try and figure out, OK, what of that role might translate back successfully uh, to them? And so I just say, look, what we're trying to do is make sure that there's a te rohanga Māori perspective, We've been traders uh, for a very long yeah. time. So, you know, that's what we're trying to achieve in terms of a progressive trade agenda. You know, I try and explain it like that so that they see the fruits of my contribution, um, not only for Māori in general and New Zealand in general, but also what, how that translates back at home. Mm. Of all the portfolios that you've held, which one are you kind of most proud of? 
Māori development and local government. Mm, why is that? And because you touch every community that you have a heart for and you get to hear um, real innovative opportunities that exist and it has evolved. And I'm quite inspired by the aspirations and the opportunities that are out there if we partner uh, with iwi and with Māori effectively. Local governments, because you know there's been a lot of talk in politics about succession planning, um, but my focus in terms of succession planning, which is why establishing the Māori wards was so important, is that succession planning. You're, give, you're giving opportunities to young Māori to be a community board or local board member and then get onto council, and then the natural progression is to come into parliament and they've already equ equipped themselves with the necessary skills to walk in two worlds confidently. Mm. Um, and then for foreign affairs, I would say increasing the number of women at post. That doesn't mm. happen by accident. That was very deliberate. Ensuring that we've had the first Indigenous chapters and trade agreements. Now, it's a starting point. It is not the exemplar, but we can move forward from there and we shouldn't move backwards. And having an Indigenous perspective uh, within foreign policy that gives us a much broader toolkit to navigate our way through in this complex time. Probably the area that still needs strengthening uh, is to ensure uh, that as foreign affairs evolves as a ministry, that it holds its treaty obligations at the front of some of its, um, the way that it operates as an organisation. Are you worried about how things might play out in the next three years? I am worried, but I don't sit in the world of worry, <laughs> you know. That's why I put my hand up to uh, represent and I uh, think that those who now have the task of representing have to turn worry into action and make sure that our, our whanau don't sit at the brunt of what could be a worrisome set of outcomes. Mm. You know, we can't have our most vulnerable whanau being further impoverished by policies that don't work for them. We can't have our kaumatua making decisions about do we pay for our power bill or our kai or our pills? We just can't have that in a country like ours, and we certainly can't have a situation uh, where the treaty is up for grabs. Um, because uh, in my mind, we've come too far um, to go, and we can't go backwards. We have to keep going forwards. We have to evolve as a nation um, with the treaty at, at the foundation of how we represent our sense of nationhood. Speaking of nationhood, the voice to Parliament for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders is, is, is dead in the water. How do you feel about that? It will take uh, the conversation within Australia, sadly, further backwards in terms of trying to not only address the long-standing issues between Australians and their Indigenous people, but to advance Indigenous aspirations. So it's a sad outcome uh, for Australia in general. Mm. Who do you think about now when you're in this, I, I guess, this time of reflection? It's 27 years. You know, I think about your whanau and... Yeah. Last night, I knew between 50% and 70% of the total vote, I, I could see how things were trending and I knew I would call it. So gave Hunter a call, um, accepted the outcome, people made their decision. Hunter's in and I'm out and I'm going to move on. I get time to spend with Fano, get time to spend on myself, I get time to do some writing, which I want to do, and I get time to map out what my next steps are and choose the things I want to put my hands to. And you know, that's quite a liberating feeling. Mm. I look at uh, a number of politicians who are out of that place and how relieved, relaxed and vibrant they look. And some of them look even younger now than they did when they were in Parliament. So, mm. you know, it's all in front of me. Mm. Do you think about your dad too, the kind of role that he played in shaping you? Yeah, I think about both my father, my mother, Teata. They all had a big influence on my life. And when I think about the things that I've achieved over these 27 years, I think they'd probably say to me, Kapo, you did really well. Did the best that you could with what you were given, and we're proud of you. Kia ora.